أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال موسى لفتاه لا أبرح حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين أو ألقي أحقبا فلما بلغا مجمع بينهما نسيا حوتهما فاتخذ سبيله في البحر سربا فلما جاوزا قال لفتاه آتنا وداء أنا لقد لقينا من سفرنا هذا نصبا قال أرأيت إذ أوينا إلى الصخرة فإني نسيت الحوت وما أنسانيه إلا الشيطان أن أذكره واتخذ سبيله في البحر عجبا قال ذلك ما كنا نبغ فارتدا على آثارهما قصصا فوجدا عبدا من عبادنا آتيناه رحمة من عندنا وعلمناه من لدنا علما قال له موسى هل أتبعك على أن تعلمني مما علمت رشدا قال إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا وكيف تصبر على ما لم تحط به خبرا قال ستجدني إن شاء الله صابرا ولا أعصي لك أمرا قال فإن اتبعتني فلا تسألني عن شيء حتى أحدث لك منه ذكرا فانطلقا حتى إذا ركبا في السفينة خرقها قال أخرقتها لتغرق أهلها لقد جئت شيئا إمرا قال ألم أقل إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا قال لا تآخذني بما نسيت ولا ترهقني من أمري عسرا فانطلقا حتى إذا لقيا غلاما فقتله قال أقتلت نفسا زكية بغير نفس لقد جئت شيئا نكرا قال ألم أقل لك إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا قال إن سألتك عن شيء بعدها فلا تصاحبني قد بلغت لدني عذرا فانطلقا حتى إذا أتيا أهل قرية استطعما أهلها فأبوا أن يضيفوهما فأبوا أن يضيفوهما فوجدا فيها جدارا يريد أن ينقض فأقامه قال لو شئت لاتخذت عليه أجرا قال هذا فراق بيني وبينك سأنبئك بتأويل ما لم تستطع عليه صبرا أما السفينة فكانت لمساكين يعملون في البحر فأردت أن أعيبها وكان وراءهم ملك يأخذ كل سفينة غصبا وأما الغلام فكان أبواه مؤمنين فخشينا أن يرهقهما طغيانا وكفرا فأردنا أن يبدلهما ربهما خيرا منه زكاة وأقرب رحما وأما الجدار فكان لغلامين يتيمين في المدينة وكان تحته كنز لهما وكان تحته كنز لهما وكان أبوهما صالحا فأراد ربك أن يبلغا فأراد ربك أن يبلغا أشدهما ويستخرجا كنزهما رحمة من ربك وما فعلته عن أمري ذلك تأويل ما لم تسطع عليه صبرا <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We continue with the explanation of سورة الكهف And now we begin the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khadir alayhi salam this story of Musa and Khadir was not a story that the disbelievers asked the Prophet ﷺ about. 
Yet Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed it in this surah because of the great benefits that it contains. Firstly, Ahlul Kitab, especially the Jews from Ahlul Kitab, their Prophet was Musa alayhi salam. So they had knowledge about some of the affairs of Musa alayhi salam. So Allah Jalla wa Ala wanted to show them that we have more knowledge of Musa alayhi salam than they did. And there will be so many benefits that can be derived from this story for the Jews and for the people of the book and the Quraysh to take lessons from. Also, this story has an indication towards the resurrection, something the kuffar of the Quraysh, they disliked hearing about because they denied it and disbelieved in it. Also, this story has many, many benefits. And so many of the scholars of Islam have authored books on this story. Some of them have mentioned over a hundred benefits from the story. Some of them have mentioned approximately 300 benefits from this story. And these are shari'i benefits that they have derived approximately 300 rulings from this story. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he spoke about the story of Musa and Khadir, he said, if only Musa became patient so we could have learnt more. So imagine how much we have actually learnt from this story. And if all of the ulama were to get together, how much they would be able to derive from such a story. So there is great benefit in the story of Musa alayhi salam. Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, regarding the story of Musa alayhi salam, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَهُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَمْضِيَ حُقُبًا And before this, there is a story behind this. And this was mentioned in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That one day, Musa alayhi salam was standing in front of his people and he was delivering a sermon. He was delivering a sermon to his people and he was touching their hearts by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala. And they were emotional and they were taking heed and reflecting upon the sermon and the reminder given by Musa alayhi salam. And the ulama said from this point of the hadith, we find how beneficial giving reminders is. And this was the practice of the Anbiya in general, that they would frequently remind their people and it also shows how a person should listen attentively to when the reminders are being given. Because Allah Jalla wa Ala says, فَذَكِّرْ That remind, because the reminders, they benefit the believers. That reminders, they benefit the believers. So Musa alayhi salam was giving them a reminder about Allah Jalla wa Ala and his religion subhanahu wa ta'ala and submitting to Allah Jalla wa Ala. Then some of the people, they asked Musa, who is the most knowledgeable person? Who is the most knowledgeable person? So Musa alayhi salam was unaware of anyone from the creation being more knowledgeable than him. So he said, I am the most knowledgeable man. I am the most knowledgeable man on earth. And he did not return the knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he should have done is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with great knowledge. And his knowledge is greater than mine. But Musa alayhi salam did not return the knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He answered the question as it came. He said, I am the most knowledgeable person on this earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach Musa alayhi salam a lesson. Allah jalla wa ala said to Musa, travel the earth until you come to the place where the two seas they meet. There you will find a man who has knowledge that you do not have. There you will find a man who has knowledge that you do not have. Musa alayhi salam, he said, what is the sign that I will find that man? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, the fish will be the sign. Carry the fish with you. And when you lose it, this is where you will find that man. Carry the fish with you. And when you lose it, this is when you will find that man. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهِ When Musa said to the young boy, who was the young boy? He was Yusha ibn Nun, who later became a prophet of Allah after the death of Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam was traveling with this young boy, Yusha ibn Nun. And Musa alayhi salam, he said, لَا أَبْرَهُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَمْضِيَ حُقُبًا I would not cease traveling until I reach the part where the two seas they meet. Or I have traveled for a long period of time, meaning a long period of my life. 
from this part of the verse and the hadith also, we find how important seeking knowledge is in Al-Islam. Musa alayhi salam was not just a prophet of Allah, but he was from Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul, from the most prominent of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was from the greatest of the prophets of Allah jalla wa ala. As we know, the greatest of the prophets of Allah jalla wa ala, Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul are five. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and Nuh alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam was from the greatest prophets of Allah. Musa was from the greatest prophets of Allah. And Allah Jalla wa ala said to him, there is someone on this earth that has some knowledge that you do not have. So Musa alayhi salam from becoming, from being the Nabi of Allah Jalla wa ala, and the prophet of his people, he now became a student of knowledge. He took a companion, which was the young boy Yusha ibn Nun. He took provisions, which was the fish that they had in the miktal, which was a, a, a case that is made out of the palm tree, so the leaves of the palm tree. And they carried this in search of knowledge. In search of knowledge. And not just in search of knowledge, but in search of a man who is not as virtuous as Musa alayhi salam. Who is not as virtuous as Musa alayhi salam. Nor is he more knowledgeable than Musa alayhi salam. Because he has knowledge of something that Musa doesn't have knowledge on. But Musa has knowledge of many things that this man will not have knowledge of. So look at Musa alayhi salam. So many things can be learned just from this part of the story. How a person can never be proud and arrogant with regards to knowledge. No matter what your level of knowledge is, you will never encompass all of the knowledge on this earth. Even if you are more knowledgeable than someone, you can benefit from that person. Even if you have to travel to meet that person, you should travel to meet that person. Even if you have to leave giving da'wah to gaining knowledge, then this is better because gaining knowledge is a prerequisite of da'wah. So you could become a da'i, you could become an alim, but then you realize that you need to study more knowledge. Should you continue with your da'wah or should you pursue knowledge? You should put your da'wah to, to a stop for a particular time and then you should go and seek knowledge. Gain more knowledge and then come back. These are all points that can be learned from just this part of the verse. So Musa alayhi salam, he said, I am going to travel. Not only is he going to travel, no matter what, we are going to get there. Meaning a firm intention that he's making. It doesn't matter how much hardship he is going to go through, he is going to pursue this knowledge. It doesn't matter how much hardship, he said, even if our entire lives, a long period of time has gone by, or amdiya huquba, like a long period of time has gone by, we are going to continue until we find this man, until we gain this knowledge. It shows you the zeal of Musa alayhi salam. And the ulama they mention, the more a person has studied knowledge, the more zeal he would have for knowledge, and the more respect he would have for knowledge and its people. Because now he knows the value of what he is seeking. When a person goes to seek knowledge the first time, he will not have that same zeal for knowledge. Nor would he have that same respect for knowledge and its people. Because he doesn't know the value of what he is acquiring. But after he is, the more he acquires, the more his love for knowledge and its people will increase. The more he acquires, the more his zeal for knowledge will increase. And this is why Musa, not just being an alim, but being a nabi and a rasul, he was so eager to find this man and to gain knowledge. And we also find this from the companions of the Prophet Like I mentioned the other day, Jabir and he traveled for months just for one narration because he knew the value of hadith. He knew the value of knowledge. The scholars will traverse this entire earth looking for knowledge. Imam Bukhari will travel for months and months not to find the hadith, no. To find information about one man who was in the chain of the hadith. One man who was in the chain of the hadith. So he would travel for so long and months and months to find one man who is in the chain of the hadith so he can grade the hadith that he has heard of. This is how they get honored knowledge. Because Allah Jalla wa ala blessed them with knowledge and the more they learned, the, the more humble they became. The more they learned, the more they appreciated knowledge. So knowledge, knowledge brings, a, uh, brings the humility. Knowledge makes a person come down to earth. Knowledge makes a person respect those who are around him even if they are not as knowledgeable as him. And no matter what your level is, you should always respect your teachers even if you have surpassed them. 
And Musa was giving this man great respect as we will see in this surah, or in this part of the surah. Musa was giving him great respect even though, even though Musa had surpassed him. And Musa was not just greater than him in knowledge, was greater than him as a human being. Was more beloved to Allah Jalla wa ala than him. Because he was from Ulul Azmi, min al Rusul. So Musa alayhi salam, he set out to view Sha'ib ibn Nun. لا أبره حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين أو أمضي حقبة I will continue traveling until I come to where the seas they meet or I have traveled for a long period of time فلما بلغ مجمع بينهما نسي حوتهما فاتخذ سبيله في البحر سربا when they came to the place where the two seas they met they forgot about their fish and their fish it was yani dead it was ready for them to eat they forgot about their fish and the fish came to life and it, and it flapped out of the case and it went into the sea. And this is a sign of resurrection that Allah Jalla wa'ala is giving mankind. The how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought this back to life again. And some of the ulama mentioned that this is the correlation between this and surat, um, and surat uh, or the story of Ashab al-Kahf. That Allah Jalla wa'ala wanted to remind the disbelievers of the resurrection in the story of the people of the cave. So Allah Jalla wa ala again in this surah, He reminds them that He can do whatever He wants, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He brought the fish to life, and it went into the water, and it escaped from them. فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَ قَالَ لِفَتَاهُ آتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا لَقَدْ لَقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبَ Then they traveled for a period of time. So they had forgotten about the fish, the fish had disappeared. Then they traveled for a period of time. And then Musa alayhi salam said to the young boy, آتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا Give, let's bring us our lunch. He didn't say, give me my lunch. And this shows you how Musa alayhi salam, if he's traveling with him, they're both sharing in everything. So it shows you the permissibility here of serving the people of virtue. Because Yusha was serving Musa alayhi salam. But it also shows you, even if a person serves the people of virtue, he will treat them just like he treats himself. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he wasn't a serve slave of Musa. But the Prophet ﷺ, when he spoke about the slaves, he said, feed them with what you feed yourself. And clothe them with what you clothe yourselves with. So some of the Sahaba, what they would do is, they would have maybe a, a complete garment, a complete outfit. And they would have maybe two of them. So they would wear the top of one and the bottom of the other. And their slave would wear the top of the other and the bottom of the other. And then they would walk out like this. So they would walk out like this and some of the Sahaba, they would see them and their children would question them because they're seeing someone. So one of the children of the Sahaba, he went to me and said, Oh uncle, if only you took the bottom of this and put it with your top, and he took the top of this and put it with his bottom. Then you would both have complete outfits. So the Sahaba would say, Oh my son, the Prophet ﷺ told us to be just with them. So whatever I wear, I will share it with him. This is how they would treat them. So we see this tarbiya with Musa alayhi salam. He didn't say, Bring me my lunch. Atina ghada'ana. Give us our, bring us our lunch. Laqad laqina min safarina hadha nasaba. Because we have faced a lot of tiredness through this journey. Meaning he's, he's bringing him into the conversation, making him feel part of Musa alayhi salam. And this shows the rahmah that the anbiya of Allah jalla wa ala had to the children or to the youth. That they would make them feel part of their society. They would make them feel part of their gatherings. And this also shows as the ulama of Islam, they mentioned how relying upon Allah jalla wa ala means you take the necessary means. Musa alayhi salam didn't say, let us just go and travel. And then when we become hungry, we'll try and find food. Let us take food with us, and when we become hungry, we will eat it. Because they will take their provisions with them when they travel. Just like the Prophet wasallam, when he used to go to the cave of Hira, he used to take his provisions. And he used to stay there until Allah Jalla wa ala wished, for as long as he wished. And he would consume his provisions. And when they would come to an end, he would go back to the house of Khadija and take more provisions. This is the meaning of tawakkul in al-Islam. That we, we take the necessary means, and then we leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that Allah jalla wa ala emphasizes in the Quran. So we mentioned previously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to part the sea for Musa. But he wanted him to do something. Just to teach Bani Adam that you have to do an action. So hit the sea with your stick. Allah jalla wa ala wanted to give Maryam the, 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 the dates that were on the palm tree. What did he tell Maryam to do? What did he say? Shake the tree. If five men were to get together, or ten men were to get together to shake the palm tree, they will not be able to shake it because it is a firm tree. 
So why did Allah Jalla wa'ala tell her to shake it? Because he wants her to take any possible means. Just so she has done some action, so then Allah Jalla wa'ala will deliver, because this is the meaning of tawakkul in al-Islam. That you take actions, you take the first step, and then you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa alayhi salam, he said to Yusha, فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَا قَالَ لِفَتَاهُ آتِنَا غَدَاءَنَا When they went and they continued with their journey, Musa alayhi salam said, bring us our lunch. لَقَدْ لَقِينَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبًا Because we have gone through some tiredness and, and, and hardship in this journey. قَالَ أَرَأَيْتَ إِذْ أَوَيْنَا إِلَى السَّخْرَةِ فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ وَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ عَجَبًا Now, one amazing thing about this story is how Allah Jalla wa ala mentions the etiquettes of Musa alayhi salam and Yusha and Khadir. How the etiquettes are with each other. How the etiquettes are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something that the believers, we really need to learn because the etiquettes are going to be very heavy on the scales on Yawm al-Qiyamah. Yusha, he said, Qala. He said, Ara'ayta id awayna ila sakhra. Do you not see, do you see that when we rested at the, at the stone or at the rock? They rested at the rock. فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ He said, I forgot the fish. He didn't say, we forgot the fish. Because now he's talking with his teacher. He's talking with the Prophet of Allah. So even though they both were responsible for it, he didn't want to attribute this to Musa alayhi salam. Because it may feel to Musa that he is blaming Musa. Or that he's accusing Musa of being careless. So he didn't say, فَإِنَّا نَسِينَ الْحُوتِ He said, فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ that indeed I forgot the fish. Again, etiquettes that Yusha had for his teacher, alayhi salam. He said, فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَ And no one made me forget except for the shaytan. Now we do not attribute the deficiencies that happened to us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Yusha, he said, shaytan is the one who made me forget. No doubt it was from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he doesn't want to make it like... Any, we attribute anything evil or anything that we have forgotten to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan is the one who made me forget. He wanted us to remain hungry. So Yusha, he sees that this is something that he's done and he's blaming himself. And then he's saying it was because of the shaitan. And it's taken an amazing route through the sea. Because it's something amazing. Because the fish, it was dead in their container. It was dead in their, in their pouch that they were carrying. So they were both amazed that this is gone. قَالَ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنَّا نَبْغِ فَارْتَدَّا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمَا قَصَصًا Musa alayhi salam, he said, this is what, this is what we were seeking. So they went and they traced their footsteps. <laughs> Something again very beneficial from this story. Was Yusha happy or sad that he lost the fish? Was he upset or was he happy? He was upset. He says, I forgot it and it was from the shaitan. Was Musa happy that they lost the fish or was he sad? He was happy. Because when you lose the fish, that's where you will meet the man in the same place that you lost it. So Yusha was upset at seeing something. And Musa alayhi salam was happy. And it shows you that sometimes you would look at something and you would not know the true reality of what it is. You may be upset, but it may be the best thing for you. You may be upset, but it is the best thing for you. And Allah Jalla wa'ala mentioned this in the Quran. كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْقِتَالُ وَهُوَ كُرْهٌ لَكُمْ but perhaps you dislike something and it is better for you. And perhaps you love something and it is not good for you. So here, Yusha was upset that they had lost the fish. But Musa said that this is what we have been seeking. This is the moment that we were waiting for. So they went and they traced their footsteps. When they came to the rock that they were at, which was where the two seas they met. They found that this was the place that they lost the fish. They found, they found a slave from the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said they found a slave from my slaves. They found the slave from the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا That Allah jalla wa ala gave him mercy from himself subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him knowledge from him subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a great dispute amongst the scholars of Islam 
Was Khadir a Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah? Or was Khadir a, a righteous man that was given inspiration? Was Khadir a, a, a Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah a prophet? Or was Khadir a righteous man? And Allah knows best, but it seems to be that the correct opinion from the ulama is that Khadir was a prophet from the prophets of Allah. Because some of the things of knowledge that was given to him and some of the actions that he did, no one could have had this information except a, a prophet. As we'll see in the story. And this is why a large number of scholars have said that he was actually a Nabi from the Anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he wasn't just a righteous slave. But the fact that Allah jalla wa ala called him a slave shows that he is someone who is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Allah jalla wa ala called Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a slave at the beginning of the surah. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitab. فَوَجَدَ عَبْدًا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا آتَيْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا That he found, or over there they found a slave from the slaves of Allah Jalla wa Ala who Allah had given mercy to and who Allah had taught knowledge to. Musa a.s. saw him and he was wearing a beautiful garment in front of him. And Musa a.s. saw him and he realized that this was the man that they were looking for. قَالَ لَهُ مُوسَى هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِ مِمَّا عُلِّمْتَ رُشْدًا Musa alayhi salam, he didn't go to him and say, Look, I am a Nabi of Allah, and I am asking you, what is that knowledge that Allah has given you that I do not have? No, because a student has to humble himself in front of his teacher, even if he is more knowledgeable than his teacher. The student has to humble himself in front of his teacher, even if he is more knowledgeable than his teacher. So Musa alayhi salam, he didn't say, I am a prophet of Allah. And I am here and to get this knowledge that you have that I don't have, so then I can complete what I have and I have more than you. He could have said this, but Musa alayhi salam, he said, هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُعَلِّمَنِي مِمَّا عُلِّمْتُ رُشْتَهُ Can I follow you so that you teach me the guidance that you have been given? Etiquette from Musa alayhi salam to his teacher. He has to seek his permission. He cannot just say, teach me. He's a student. The student doesn't demand from the sheikh. The student doesn't command the sheikh. He said, can I? Can I follow you? Khadir can say yes, he can say no. Can I follow you so you can teach me from that which you have been blessed with, the guidance that you have received? So Khadir, he says to Musa, قَالَ إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبْرًا You will not be able to be patient with me. A teacher is allowed to discipline his student. A teacher is allowed to be severe with his student. A teacher is allowed to inform his student that the knowledge that he's going to seek is going to be difficult for him. Or maybe for the level of his understanding or the level of his patience. So Khadir, he said, إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ sabra." You will not be able to remain patient with him. Why did he say this? Because he knows the type of knowledge that Allah Jalla wa ala has given him. That Musa is going to see this and he's going to want the answer straight away. But Khadir is not going to give the answer straight away. He's going to give the answers after a period of time. And this shows us that the scholar or the teacher does not have to respond to a student immediately, nor does he have to clarify things immediately. He can teach him and teach him, and when he believes that he is ready to absorb that different type of information, then he can give it to him. So it doesn't mean everything the student is asked for he is given, because the student doesn't know what is good for himself. The teacher knows what is good for the student. Because this is the knowledge that he has acquired by the permission of Allah Jalla wa ala. And the hardship that he went through to gain it. And the tarbiyah that he received to gain it. So he values this knowledge more than the student because he has tasted it. And he knows its greatness. So when he believes it is right for him to tell his student about it, he will tell his student about it. And that's why even at times the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would teach the Sahaba knowledge and he would say, do not convey it to anyone. Like when he taught Mu'adh radiyallahu an, أَفَلَا أُبَشِّرُ بِهِ nas. Should I tell the people about this type of knowledge? Should I give them the glad tidings? لَا تُبَشِّرْهُمْ فَيَتَّكِلُوا Do not tell them because then they'll rely upon it. So Mu'adh after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and when he became old and he thought he was going to die, then he conveyed the knowledge. Because he wasn't sure, should I withhold it from them for eternity? Or only until I think they are ready? Now I'm going to pass away and I haven't conveyed this message. So the knowledge will be lost. So then he, he passed it on just before he passed away. So it shows you how the ulama of Islam, they, will not, they, they, they are not required to give all of their knowledge to everyone. Those who are deserving of their knowledge, they will receive it. 
Those who are ready for their knowledge, they will receive it. Those who they believe this knowledge is not suitable for, they will not give that knowledge to them. And this shows you wisdom with knowledge. Not everyone is ready for every type of knowledge. Sometimes the person will ask about detailed matters of worldly affairs. It doesn't concern him. That he doesn't need to be given uh, any insight into this matter at all. Because it has nothing to do with him. It's not going to affect his lifetime. So this is why Khadir alayhi salam, he said to Musa alayhi salam, إِنَّكَ لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ sabra." You are not going to be able to remain patient with me. So Musa alayhi salam, he said, قَالَ سَتَجِدُنِي إِن شَاءَ اللَّهُ صَابِرًا وَلَا أَعْصِي لَكَ أَمْرًا Inshallah, you would find me patient. And I will not disobey your command. Again now, another reason. Allah Jalla wa'ala mentions the story of Inshallah before, in this surah. And now he's showing its implementation. This is how we use Inshallah. Musa a.s. can he guarantee that he's going to be patient? No, because he doesn't know the unseen. So he says, I will try my best if Allah Jalla wa'ala wills. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, then I will try my best. And this is again, etiquette with the teacher. He didn't say, how can you say I'm not going to be patient? This is how students will react today. They say, be patient with this knowledge, you may not, you know, who, how, how do you know I can? I can gain it, I know I can. This is how they will respond. But Musa said, inshallah, I will be patient. And I will not disobey your command. I mean, I will try my best to do this. And he didn't say, I will do this. He said, you will find me patient. Meaning etiquette, because you are the one who is looking at my affairs. You are the one who is going to be analyzing what I'm doing and taking care of me. So you will find me patient. So again, this is etiquette with his teacher, with the wording that he chose. Khadir alayhi salam, he said, قَالَ فَإِنِ اتَّبَعْتَنِي فَلَا تَسْأَلْنِي عَنْ شَيْءٍ حَتَّى أُحْدِثَ لَكَ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا He said that if you follow me, if you follow me, then do not ask me about anything until I mention it to you. If you follow me, then do not ask me about anything until I mention it to you. Meaning, questions are prohibited. You will see things that may amaze you, may shock you. They may even put fear into your heart. They may make you question my actions and my legitimacy and my knowledge. But if you choose to follow me, then do not ask me about anything until I tell you. This shows the permissibility of a teacher making a condition on his students. You can accompany me, but do not ask me any questions. You can accompany me, but sit over there. You can accompany me, but do not say anything when I'm speaking to someone, or do not come in front of me. He can make a question, he can make a condition, if he wants his student to accompany him. And this shows the permissibility from this as well. Just from this part of the story, we've already mentioned so many benefits. Imagine in the books that actually are specialized just to compile the benefits from this story. They mention hundreds. Just from this part of the story. And this shows you the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can continuously derive benefits from them without any ending. Without any ending. You can look for the words, how the words are different, how they are formed. And so many benefits can be derived. Fantalaqah. حتى إذا ركب في السفينة خرقها. So they moved together and they came to a ship or a boat. What is mentioned in the hadith is that Khadir was walking with Musa عليه السلام on the shore and they wanted to cross, but they didn't have anything with them. And a group of people they had their boat and they were sailing and they saw Khadir and they recognized him. And they knew him because he, they knew him to be a pious man. So they said to Khadir, come on with us and bring your companion with us as well. And we will not take anything from you. We will not charge you for this service. This shows the permissibility of helping and honoring the people of virtue. And also serving the people of virtue. And giving them a platform, a station that is above the station of the rest of the people. So Musa and Khadir, they are now sailing on their boat or their ship. And when they get to the end, the people say, we are not going to charge you. They leave. Khadir, he takes a plank out of the boat and he damages the boat. And then he walks away with Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam now, he's shocked. These people have just helped us. They have allowed us to ride. 
They have not charged us anything. And you have just come and damaged his boat. And sorry, even before this, while they were on the boat, they saw a bird come and it pecked at the water. And Khadir said to Musa, Oh Musa, our knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah Jalla wa'ala is less than this bird and the amount of water it has just taken from the ocean. <coughs> Reminding Musa of the reason why he was sent to Khadir. That you never attributed the knowledge back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My knowledge and your knowledge put together is nothing when it compares when we compare it to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This also shows how the mu'allim, how the teacher teaches his student to be humble. Reminds his student of his level frequently. That don't think you're an alim. Don't think that you have achieved a lot. You're still at the beginning stages of study. To give discipline his student and train him. And this is the purpose of having a teacher in Islam. He's not just there to teach you knowledge. He's there to nurture you. He's there to allow you to understand how to implement this knowledge. Then Allah Jalla wa Ala, He said, فَانْتَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا رَكِبَ فِي السَّفِينَةِ خَرَقَهَا They traveled together until they boarded the, the boat or the ship and then He damaged the ship. Alhamdulillah, خَرَقَهَا Musa, He said, قَالَ أَخَرَقَتَهَا لِتُغْرِقَ أَهْلَهَا لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا إِمْرًا Have you damaged this so you can drown its people? You have just done something terrible. Have you just damaged the ship? So you can drown its people. When the people are going to sail on the ship, what's going to happen? The water is going to come in, they're going to drown. What have you done? Have you just damaged the ship to drown its people? You have done something terrible. <laughs> Didn't I say that you will not be able to be patient with me? Didn't I say to you that you will not be able to be patient with me? قَالَ لَا تُؤَخِذْنِي بِمَا نَسِيتْ وَلَا تُرْهِقْنِي مِنْ أَمْرِ عُسْرَى Musa alayhi salam he said, Do not hold me to account for what I forgot. Do not hold me to account for what I, what I forgot. And do not, uh, and, and, sorry, do not take me to account for what I forgot. And do not hold me in this matter like with hardship and with harshness. I mean, I just forgot. It was a mistake. I'm a human being. Like, let me off, give me another chance. This is what Musa alayhi salam is saying. And this shows you how a student should also apologize to his teacher. And how he should admit that the mistake was from himself. Musa could have said, but you never said you were going to damage someone's boat and try and kill a people. He could have said this. This is what the students will probably say today, if they were to see this happening. But Musa, but Musa said, no, I'll accept the mistake. You made the condition, I'm not going to ask you. I broke the condition, irrespective of what I saw. Irrespective of what I saw, I broke the condition. So I apologize for this. Please do not hold me to account for what I forgot. فَانْطَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا لَقِيَا غُلَامًا فَقَتَلَهُ So then they walked together and they continued in their journey. They saw a young boy. What happened? Khadir went to him and he killed him. They saw a young boy. Khadir went to him in the hadith where he plucked his head off his body. Khadir went to him and he killed him. Musa alayhi salam now has just seen someone, Khadr, killing what he believes is an innocent young boy in front of his own eyes. And this is why the ulama said, he was a Nabi and not a pious man. Because the person would not get the inspiration from Allah to kill someone, and if he did, he would not be, able, he would not be allowed to do it. But as for a Nabi, the revelation will come to him, and then he can act according to the revelation. So Khadr went to this boy, and he killed him. Musa was shocked. When the plank of wood was removed from the boat. Because you are try, you're trying to drown the people. Maybe they will drown, maybe they will not drown. But now he has seen someone being killed right in front of his own two eyes. Now Musa cannot hold back. Have you just killed an innocent soul that has no sin? Have you just killed an innocent soul that has no sin? You have done something incredible, incredibly terrible and evil. First he said Imra, something very ter something terrible. Now he said Nukra, something that you should be rebuked for. Something that people should denounce your action and should, they should speak against you for this. You have done something terrible over here. What did he say? قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكَ إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِلَ صَبْرًا Did I not say to you that you will not be able to be patient with me? 
Look back, inshallah, what was the first time um, Khadir rebuked Musa? What did he say? Over he said, قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ No. قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكَ First he said, قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ إِنَّكَ Didn't I say, indeed you will not be able to. Then the second time, did I not say to you? Because he's been now, he's harsher with Musa. First he was saying, didn't I not, didn't I not, didn't I not say that, did I not say that you will not be able to be patient? So he's, he's saying it to him, but with more etiquette. Second time, did I not say to you? Now he's singling him out. Because now it's the second time he's disobeyed him. It's the second time he's gone against the condition. So it shows you how the teacher, he begins soft with his student. And then over time, he is allowed to be more harsh and more harsh if he's going to discipline his student. But he begins with ease. And he begins with softness. And again, this is how Khadir was with Musa alayhi salam. Didn't I not say to you that you will not be able to be patient? Musa realizes that he made a mistake again. Even though he saw a terrible act in front of his eyes, he did break the condition that he made that he is not going to question Qadir for anything. قَالَ إِنْ سَأَلْتُكَ عَنْ شَيْءٍ بَعْدَهَا فَلَا تُصَاحِبْنِي قَدْ بَلَغْتَ مِنْ لَدُنِّي عُذْرًا So Musa alayhi salam, he said, if I ask you for anything again, then do not accompany me. Do not stay with me. That is, yani the final excuse that will be taken from me. Musa alayhi salam realizes that this is his mistake. He said, look, final chance. I admit I was wrong the first two times. Give me one more chance. And if I do not remain patient with you, then leave me. Then go away. Then, then, there is no, then I do not deserve to be in your company. I do not deserve to spend time with you. Can you imagine someone more knowledgeable saying this to someone who has less knowledge than him? Musa just wants to acquire some knowledge from him. Because Allah Jalla wa ala told him there is a man on this earth who has knowledge that you do not have. So he wants to go to Qadir and find out what is this knowledge that I do not have? Teach me about it. Let me know. فَانْطَلَقَ حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَيَا أَهْلَ قَرْيَةٍ اسْتَطْعَمَا أَهْلَهَا Then they continued in their journey and they went to a town, a village and they were hungry. They asked the people if they could feed them. And they were guests in that country and from the Sharia of Musa and from the Sharia of Khadir and also from the Sharia of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam If a guest comes to you and he comes at your door Someone who has just come from another country, another land, he's come to your door, you cannot refuse him. You are not allowed to refuse him. If you have something to give him, you must give it to him. Because he has just gone through this hardship. He doesn't know anyone there. He's in a foreign land. This is the haq, uh, a, an obligatory right he has upon you of the other, of serving him and hosting him. So Musa and Khadir, they have gone to the village and they have asked the people to feed them. So they refused. They said, we are not going to host you. We are not going to host you. They are not fulfilling the rights of Musa and Khadir. Give us some food, feed us. We are not going to feed you. We are not going to host you at all. Go away from us. They found there a wall which was about to collapse in that same village. So Khadir came and he amended the wall. The wall is about to fall and collapse. Khadir came and he put the wall in its place. He took whatever he needed to amend the wall and he amended the wall. Musa said, قَالَ لَوْ لَتَّخَذْتَ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا He said, if you wished, you could have taken a wage for this. Meaning these people refused to give us our rights and you are fixing their wall for free. So what are you doing? If they are doing this to us and they are not even giving our rights, at least take a wage from them. At least ask him to give you, reimburse you for what you have done, what you spent on it from your time and your effort. What did he do? He questioned the action of Khadir. So Khadir, he said to Musa, قَالَ هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ سَأُنَبِّئُكَ بِتَأْوِيلِ مَا لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صبرا. He said, this is now me and you parting. This is the end of our time together. Because Musa alayhi salam said, if I ask you again, then go. This is now the separation between us, me and you. But look at Khadir now. He knows that these things will be in the mind of Musa. And it is not permissible to leave your student in doubt. 
it is not permissible to leave your student in doubt. And that's why the qaida ta'khir al bayan an waqt al haja la yajuz. To delay information in the time of need is not permissible. And that's a great qaida in Islam. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's what we find. If he never explained something at that time, it wasn't needed. But if he explained it, then that means he would have had to explain it because it was needed at that time. So to delay information when it is required, when it is needed, is not permissible. So Khadir, he said to Musa, قَالَ هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكِ He said, this is the separation now between me and you. سَأُنَبِّئُكَ بِتَأْوِيلِ مَا لَمْ تَسْتَطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا I will now give you the explanation, the interpretation of that which you are unable to remain patient for. I will give you the explanation, the interpretation for that, the justification for that which you are unable to remain patient for. <coughs> if Musa was patient, we would, we would have had more than these three stories. And that's why the Prophet said, if only, may Allah have mercy on Musa, if only he was patient. We could have benefited a lot more. I remember when I used to read this story in the Quran, and I used to think, subhanAllah, how many benefits can we actually derive from this story? Then I saw some of the tafasir of the ulama where they've gathered 100, 200, 300 benefits. And I was thinking, subhanAllah, if only Musa was patient. But how many benefits would we have gathered from this story? And there's no doubt the Prophet ﷺ had more than 300 benefits that he could have derived from this story. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Khadir now is going to justify his actions to Musa alayhi salam. أَمَّا السَّفِينَ فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكُ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبَ he said, as for the ship, or as for the boat, فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ It belonged to Masakin, poor people, that worked on the sea. As for the ship, it belonged to poor people that worked on the sea. A great benefit that the ulama did derive from this, it is permissible for a poor person to own possession and still be classified as poor. They are Masakin. Yes? They are masakin and they own a boat that they are working on. So a person cannot say, oh, they own a boat, so how can they be miskin? They own a boat, this is their means of livelihood. If they never had this boat, they would not have any livelihood whatsoever. But the miskin has more wealth than the faqir. And that's what Allah Jalla wa'ala said, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُقَرَاءِ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ Allah began with fuqara and then miskin. So what is the difference between a faqir and a miskin, because they are two separate categories of people, we can give zakat to. The faqir is the one who has no means of livelihood. So he has no wealth for himself for the entire year. So when zakat is given to him, it is given to him for the entire year. He is the faqir. The miskin is someone who has a means of income, but his income is not sufficient for the entire year. So you will only give him what is required for the rest of the year. Is that distinction clear? The faqir is someone who doesn't have any livelihood. So you need to give him that which he requires for the entire year. The miskin is something, someone who has something. He has some sort of livelihood, but he doesn't have enough for himself and his family for the entire year. So he will be given the remainder for the year. So he has more wealth than the faqir, but he is still not wealthy enough to abstain from zakah. He can take from zakah. So Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says, أَمَّا السَّفِينَ فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ As for the ship or the boat, it was for the poor people that were working on the sea. فَأَرَدْتُ أَنْ أَعِيبَهَا And I wanted to damage it. وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكُ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا And behind it there was a... a, a وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ And in another قِرَاءَةٍ وَكَانَ أَمَامَهُمْ To show that وَرَاءَ can also mean أَمَام and this is not from the Ashraf, huh? This is not from the Ashraf. So, وَكَانَ أَمَامَهُمْ And in front of it, there was a, a Malik. يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا And as Ibn Abbas mentioned, يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ صَالِحَةٍ غَصْبًا That he was taking, and that was another qira'a, that, 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 they, they, they call it qira'a shadda, that, that is another qira'a, that they, he, a, an angel, uh, not angel, a, a, the king was there, and he was taking every ship and every boat, that had no deficiency on it. He was taking it from its people. So he would go around and he would send his men to the sea and to the rivers. And he would say, if you find any boat that has no deficiency on it, 
then take it. It will belong to me. However, if he has a deficiency, then leave it. I have nothing to do with it. So Khadir alayhi salam, he damaged the boat of the masakin. He damaged the boat of the poor people. And he damaged the boats of the people that hosted him. Not in order to cause them harm. In order to bring them benefits. And so many things and so many Islamic principles can be derived from this. But we'll just take a few inshallah ta'ala. This shows you how not everything you see, the reality of it is how it appears to you. Especially if you do not have the detailed knowledge of what is happening. Today, as I mentioned many times before, that the youth especially and the laymen, they want to speak about everything and they want to comment on everything and they want to criticize everyone. Because to them, it appears that something is happening or some verdicts are incorrect. Or what some of the people of knowledge are saying goes against what they believe and what they understand. But these lay people are not qualified to know the detailed matters of what is happening. So their job is to remain quiet and not question and wait for the people of knowledge to give clarity. <coughs> because those who have knowledge of the affairs will be able to give you a better judgment and understanding of what is happening. And this is why so many people and so many scholars, when you ask them questions about a different country, they will say, go to the ulama of that country. And ask them because they know the affairs of that country better than we do. How can we speak about a people when we do not know their affairs? We do not know their realities. So it is not always how it appears to you at first glance and first instance. It's not always when you see something, oh, this is how it must be. It's not, that's not necessarily the reality. Musa السلام, saw him damaging the property of poor people who helped them. And this appeared to him that he was doing zulm to them. But in reality, Khadir was not, was not doing zulm to them. What was Khadir doing? He was helping them and saving their wealth. It also shows you how a person of authority and a person of knowledge can damage someone's wealth in order to save it. He can damage someone's wealth in order to save it. And that's only damaging a part of his wealth. Because now, there are two evils over here. And look at this. This is where you derive the qa'idah from. If there are two evils, you take what? The lesser of the two evils. So either now, the king is going to take their boat away, or you are going to damage their property and save their boat. Damaging someone's property is an evil. And the king seizing the boat is an evil. So what will he do in this case? He will do the lesser of the two evils in order to gain the greater benefit. The lesser of the two evils in order to gain the greater benefit. Ashashari qa'id can be derived from this. Now we've always had the principle, the lesser of the two evils. And people will say, ah, what sort of principle is this? It's established in the Quran. Khadir could say, okay, I don't want to get involved in any evil. So what I will do is, I'm just going to, I'm going to leave the boat, we'll let the king take it. Is this, does this go according to his intellect? Does this go in according to our Islamic principles? Let this king do zulm on them, he'll take it. Or Khadir could say, I could do an action which appears to be evil in front of people. But I will be rewarded for doing this action of evil. <coughs> I will be rewarded for doing this action of evil, which appears to be evil to them. I'm going to damage someone's property and be rewarded for it. Because it's not just about the damaging of the property that we look at. Why did he damage the property? Can any of us say that Khadir was sinful for doing what he did? No. Do we all agree that damaging people's property is evil? Yes. Damaging a poor person's property is even more evil. Damaging a poor person who helped you is even more evil. That's why Musa was shocked. But Khadir damaged the property not because he had hatred for them, or not because he wanted to harm them. And that's why it is not always about the actions which are apparent to us. It is the reasons behind the actions that need to be looked at. And sometimes the reasons are unknown unless we find out from the person why he did it. Unless we find out from the person why he did it. Why did this sheikh give a fatwa? I don't agree with fatwa. Why did he give it? Maybe he saw something that I didn't see. Why did this person carry out this action? Give him the benefit of the doubt, akhi. Maybe he has some knowledge that you do not have. Maybe there's a reason behind why he did something. So Khadir did something which appears to everyone that he is a criminal and a sinner. And he has committed a crime. He has done an action which is apparently evil. 
but it is less evil than what the king was about to do. So he is praised for his action. He has done something praiseworthy. And he is rewarded by Allah Jalla wa'ala for damaging their boat. And this is why sometimes you say, but this person is saying that we can do haram, and we're going to be rewarded for it. Or this haram has become recommended. Or this haram has become obligatory. What sort of fatwa is this? Only The only person that would say this is a jahil person that doesn't know the qawaid of the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The alim will know that this thing, it is haram, yes, in and of itself. But if we do not take this means, what's going to happen? That we are going to fall into a greater calamity. So this haram now will become prescribed. Like now a person is about to die. And the only thing in front of him is, is the meat of a, the pig. He has, pork in front, he has a pig in front of him, he's about to die of hunger. It's haram to sacrifice a pig. It's haram to take from its meat. It's haram. But this person, what does he do? He sacrifices the animal. He eats the animal. People look at him and say, what sort of a person is eating this? That I am rewarded by Allah Jalla wa'ala for doing this. And this was obligatory upon me to do to save my life. So he has now eaten the meat of the, the pig, which is haram by consensus. And he is rewarded by Allah Jalla wa'ala for doing it. Correct? Because what is the lesser, uh, what is the greater evil? <coughs> to let himself die from hunger when he could have saved himself or to consume something which Allah made haram? To let himself die is the greater evil. Because now he could have protected himself in some way. So to do some type of haram, to preserve yourself from the greater haram with the condition that this greater haram is inevitable. It's definitely going to happen. It's not something that we believe that it may happen. It's definitely going to happen. Then this becomes something which is prescribed in the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the sharia of Allah jalla wa ala is not black and white as people think it to be. And this is what I'm trying to achieve from this. Now sometimes, as laymen, we believe that the sharia of Allah jalla wa ala is simple. It's this way or it's this way? It's black or it's white? But it's not the case. The Sharia of Allah is very detailed. Because it is not just a religion for us to follow. It is a complete structured way of life. A complete structured way of life that teaches us every aspect of our dunya and our, and our deen. It teaches us everything that we need to know. So Allah Sharia is very, very intense. And it, it, it requires a lot of knowledge and understanding for us to grasp what is actually happening. If a person now, he stands right in front of the wall. He puts his head right in front of the wall. What can he do? He can just see that part of the wall. And this is like the person who begins to study. He believes, because he doesn't know how deep knowledge is. He believes that this is the whole knowledge, all of ilm. So when he gains this, he starts refuting this person and speaking against that person and speaking ill of that person. Because he believes that the whole of the deen is this knowledge that he has in front of his face. Then he'll start to learn, so he'll take a step back. And another step back. And another step back. And the more he steps he takes back, the more he can see of the wall. And the more he learns, the further he will go back. Because the more you learn, the more you realize you need to learn. The more you learn, the more you realize you need to learn. The more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And that's what Bakr Abu Zayd, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in his kitab of Talab al-Ilm, he said that the first stage of a person gaining knowledge is arrogance. That he believes he has all knowledge. Then he will start, it will hit him, it will hit him that he hasn't gained anything. So the second stage of knowledge is that he will accuse himself of being a criminal and, and refuting ulama and speaking about people of knowledge without justice. Then the third state of knowledge is that he will realize that this is the knowledge that he has acquired and there are oceans in front of him that he has not gone near. These are the three stages of a student of knowledge. If we learn this beforehand, we can inshallah ta'ala skip the first two stages. And not become arrogant. And this is what is required for learning the story of Musa and Khadir. And this is what is required of learning the knowledge of the deen. Question we'll take later, inshallah. <laughs> what? What's the three, three stages. The first stage is arrogance. And the person he gains knowledge and he thinks he has gained everything. So he's sitting right in front of the wall and he thinks that this is the whole knowledge which is in front of him. Then, the second stage is you start to speak to people and you realize that what have I done? I've been refuting ulama, I've been speaking about masail and I had no right to speak about. He starts accusing himself of being a criminal and being completely ignorant. And not even recognizing that the little knowledge he, gained, he has gained it. And then the third state of knowledge is that he realizes what he knows and he realizes that there are oceans in front of him that he still needs to learn about. 
and he still needs to know. Clear? Okay. Again, as I said, there are so many, there are tons of benefits that we can take, but we just want to take some of the main benefits, insha'Allah ta'ala, and then continue moving. وَأَمَّا الْغُلَامِ And as for the, the young boy, the boy that Khadir, he killed. فَكَانَ أَبَوَاهُ مُؤْمِنَيْنِ فَخَشِيْنَا أَن يُرْهِقَهُمَا تُغْيَانًا وَكُفْرًا As for the young boy, then his parents, they were believers. فَخَشِيْنَا And we feared that they would fall into, we feared that they would fall into oppression and disbelief. فَأَرَدْنَا أَن يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا مِّنْهُ زَكَاةً وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمًا and we wanted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would replace them with that which is better and that which is more of a mercy from him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah jalla wa ala gave Khadir the knowledge that this child is an evil child and his parents have great love for him. They were so happy when he was born and their heart is so attached to this child and his parents are very pious people. But because of the great love they have for their child, he is going to disbelieve and he is going to make his parents also disbelieve. So out of a mercy from Allah, he wanted Khadir to kill this child. So his parents will remain upon Iman. His parents will remain upon Iman. As a rahmah from Allah Jalla wa ala to them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them better than this. So they will give them another child who is better than this child. And it will be a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shows us how Allah Jalla wa Ala protects the righteous. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala protects the righteous. If you are truly righteous and you are striving to please Allah, He will protect you. Because the means were there for them to fall into disbelief, but Allah Jalla wa Ala will protect you. It also shows us how a, the, the children could even be a test for the pious people. If Allah hadn't protected them, they would have he, the child would have diverted them from belief into. Disbelief. So how the children are such a great fitna, going back to Al-Malu wal Banuna, Zinatul Hayatid Dunya. That wealth and children are an adornment of this life. That the children can be such a fitna that they could drive their parents from belief into disbelief. This also shows us that the parents would have been so upset, as Imam Al-Qurtubi said, the parents were so happy when he was born and they were so upset when he was killed. But they didn't realize that they should have been happy that he was killed because they did not know the affairs of the hereafter. And, and Imam al Qurtubi he said, This is something now that would make it easier for parents to understand the loss of their children. <coughs> that Allah Jalla wa Ala will only do things for the believers if it is good for them. So if you have taken your child, it was good for you, it was the best for your dunya and the akhirah. Especially if he has taken your child before he has become an adult, your child is already in Jannah waiting for you. We'll take your hand on Yawm al Qiyamah. And he will take you to Jannah. So it is a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So calamities have become lessened by understanding this. This is what Imam al-Qurtubi said. That the calamities for us to take has become easier for us to take. Because we learn from this. That Allah Jalla wa Ala will only give the believers good. He will only give the believers good. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Qadir he said. وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارِ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا He says, وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارِ As for the wall, the wall that was about to crumble and he put the wall upright again and he amended it. فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ It belonged to two young boys who lived in the city. Two young boys who lived in the city. Before he said, they went to a city or a village. Did Allah use the word Qarya or Medina? Qarya. Qarya. And now they use the word Medina. Qarya, they use the word, Allah Jalla used the word at that time to show that because these people, they weren't really hosting them, that they are something which are small and insignificant. And the Qarya compared to the Medina, the village compared to the city is something which is small, it's insignificant. So because they weren't hosting them and fulfilling their rights, Allah wanted to show the, the people that you know, they're really not worthy of giving any honor to and speaking about. But when Allah spoke about the two young boys who were orphaned, they haven't done anything wrong. So Allah addressed their town as the Medina to raise their status. So this is how Allah in the Quran, He addresses things to show us that 
If they are people of honor and people of goodness, we honor them. And if people are not the people of honor and goodness, then we do not give them the same respect as we give the people of honor and, and, and the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, what is the as for the wall, it belonged to two orphans who are living in the Medina, in the, in the city. And underneath this wall, there was a treasure that belonged to them. Underneath this wall, there was a treasure that belonged to these boys. And their fathers were pious, their fathers were righteous. So their father was righteous. فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ أَنْ يَبْلُغَ أَشُدَّهُمَا وَيَسْتَخْرِجَ كَنْزَهُمَا رَحْمَةً مِنْ رَبِّكَ And their Lord wanted them to become older. And when they were mature enough, that they would take this treasure out and it would be a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. وَمَا فَعَلْتُهُ عَنْ أَمْرِي And I never did this from my own command. ذَلِكَ تَأْوِيلُ مَا لَمْ تَصْطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا And this is the interpretation of that which you are unable to remain patient with. Look how Allah Jalla wa'ala took care of these orphans. How did Allah, why did Allah Jalla wa'ala take care of them? وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Because their father was righteous. For the ulama of Islam, they said, if you are striving to be a worshipper of Allah Jalla wa'ala, then do not worry if you pass away, Allah Jalla wa'ala will take care of your children. As long as you strive for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you try and give your children the greatest upbringing, if something then happens to you, do not worry. Allah Jalla wa Ala will take care of your children. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will take care because every single person, when he's about to pass away, he thinks about his children. He thinks about who's going to take care of them. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, "Do not worry. If you take care of the commands and prohibitions of Allah Jalla wa Ala, Allah, as a mercy to you, will take care of your children." So Khadir, Allah Jalla wa Ala sent Khadir to a land that were not hosting him. To a land that did not give him his rights. To a land where the people, if they saw this treasure, they would have stolen it and taken it. So Allah Jalla wa'ala directed him to a wall that was about to crumble. And told him to amend this wall because of the ibadah of the father of these two children. Because he has left this treasure behind. And right now if they were to take the treasure, they will, they will not be able to use it in the most productive way. So wait for them to be older, then they would themselves discover it. So this shows us how a person is not allowed to be given wealth if he is not ready for it. If he is not ready for it. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, الْيَتَامَ حَتَّى إِذَا بَلَغُوا النِّكَاءِ فَإِنْ آنَسْتُمْ مِنْهُمْ رُشْتًا فَادْفَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ أَمْوَالَهُمْ That test the orphans with wealth. I Meaning give them something, go to the shop, purchase it. See if they come back with it. Alhamdulillah. Until they come at a suitable age and then give them their wealth to them. So you don't give their wealth straight away. You test them with it until you find out that they have, they are, they are responsible enough to be able to use it. And then you give them their wealth afterwards when you believe that they are responsible. So Allah Jalla wa mentions these principles here. But the main principle we want to focus on and we want to take back with us is that if we are pious and we strive our utmost to serve Allah Jalla wa and His religion, Allah Jalla wa will take care of our children for us. We need that sincerity and we need that determination and focus. And then insha'Allah ta'ala our children will be left in the hands of Allah Jalla wa'ala. And whoever is left in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will be looked after. This is also a great benefit that we can take from this part. And he said, Rahmatan min Rabbik, as a mercy from Allah. Wa ma fa'altuhu an amri. When he concludes with Musa, he said, I never did this by myself. Meaning, he's attributed it to who? Allah. Reminding Musa, you are about to leave now. I have just attributed everything I have given you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So do not forget to attribute your knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not forget to attribute your knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ذَلِكَ تَأْوِيلُ مَا لَمْ تَصْطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا This is something that you are unable to remain patient with. Just to conclude here inshallah ta'ala. Allah jalla wa'ala said, تَسْتَطِعْ 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 And he ends with تَسْطِعْ For those who understand Arabic. Sahih? تَسْتَطِعْ To mean that that, that which you couldn't remain patient with. You couldn't remain. And it means the same thing here, that which you couldn't remain patient with. Why is the wording used different? Ziyadatul mabna tadul ala ziyadatul ma'na. In the Arabic language. When something has more letters than it, it has a greater meaning behind it. Like no two words in the Arabic language are exactly the same. So tastati' has more word, more letters than tastati' It has an extra letter. And this is because Musa at this time, he didn't know what was happening in front of him. 
Mm-hmm. Like you've just um, broken the ship. So it's something which is severe. You are not. It's so severe that you are unable to ha- be patient with this. He's killed someone. You are unable. It's so severe. That's not it. You've um, just met, met, amended the wall. It's just not it. Why are you doing it? Now he's given him the interpretation of it. It's lighter for him to understand. That's what you now couldn't remain patient with. Because his, his, uh, his concerns now are a lot less than it were before. So that's why he said now it's less of a concern for you. This is what you are unable to be patient with. So it shows you how the Quran in each and every letter Allah Jalla wa ala has chosen. When he spoke it subhanahu wa ta'ala, there were benefits behind it. And that's why there is no such thing as a letter that was just put there for the sake of being there. Every letter Allah Jalla wa ala placed in the Quran was chosen for a reason, gives an additional meaning to it. Maybe the people have discovered it today, maybe they were unable to understand why, but there is no such thing as Allah Jalla wa ala placing a letter there without a reason. Because he is Al Hakim, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the end of the story of Musa and Khadir.